let's have a look at this practice a little bit more in detail. So again, I'd like to read from Attention Revolution, page 47. He says the following. The Buddha described the practice of mindfulness of breathing with the following analogy. So now he's quoting from one of Buddha's sutras. He says, Just as in the last month of the hot season, when a mass of dust and dirt has swirled up, a great rain cloud out of season disperses it and quells it on the spot. So too, concentration by mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, is peaceful and sublime, an ambrosial dwelling, and it disperses and quells on the spot unwholesome states whenever they arise. And then uh, Alan Wallace is commenting on that. He says the following. This analogy refers to the healing effect of balanced attention. When awareness is brought to rest on a neutral object such as the breath, immediately every distressing thought disappears and the mind becomes peaceful, sublime and happy. These qualities do not arise from the object of awareness, the breath, but from the nature of the mind in a state of balance. This approach to healing the mind is similar to healing the physical body. The, the Buddha implied in his rain cloud analogy that the mind, like the body, has an innate power to heal itself. By clearly attending to a neutral object with sustained attention, without craving or aversion, we enable the mind to begin its own healing. And so that's one thing we'll see in this shamatha practice. As we get more into the shamatha practice, the more that our mental afflictions such as craving, attachment, jealousy, irritation and so forth, the more that they will quieten down. It's not that the shamatha practice is eliminating them, but due to balancing the body and mind, we, it's harder for those to arise. It's harder for a certain stimulus to provoke those reactions in us. Of course, we are eliminating the mental affliction through the Vipassana practice, but the shamatha practice itself um, has a very positive impact in that regard. And there's another um, short uh, verse from Shantideva who says, those with a distracted mind are trapped in the jaws of the mental afflictions. So as long as we get caught up in a lot of distraction, we're predisposing ourselves to a lot of mental afflictions arising, to getting reacting to various stimulus, pleasant and unpleasant. And then he goes on, he says, since coarse excitation, so coarse excitation is when we get completely swept away from the object, is still, predominant, is still the predominant problem during the third stage of attentional development, you may find it helpful to continue counting the breaths. Some Theravada teachers following the 5th century scholar Buddha, Buddha Gosa offer two methods involving quick counting. In the first of these techniques, you count from 1 to 10 with each full respiration. In the second, with each full breath cycle, you count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so forth. Um, so basically involves more counting, counting uh, like 1 up to 10 during uh, one cycle of breath. A Sangha, on the other hand, so he's also another 5th century Buddhist master, suggested counting the breaths backward from 10 to 1. So, of course, if we have to count backwards, we have to pay closer attention. So that could also be very helpful in being more focused. After that, you may try counting two breaths as one, four as one, and so on, slowing the pace of counting to in include even larger clusters of breaths. So, again, at the beginning, if you're very, very heavily distracted, you may do multiple counts within one breath, so even one up to ten in one cycle, and then slowly, less and less, so you maybe count uh, one on the in-breath, two on the out-breath, and then one on in-breath, out-breath, and then, as he suggests, 
then maybe do three breaths and count that as one. So you slow the counting right down. However you choose to count the breaths, when your attention stabilizes to such an extent that you no longer experience lapses of attention, but remain continuously engaged on with each inhalation and exhalation, you can stop counting. That temporary crutch has served its purpose. Asanga commented, though, that the various methods for counting the breaths are not for everyone. They may help some people to counteract, counteract laxity and excitation, but others may find that they can focus their attention quite effectively on the respiration without counting. Such people don't need to bother with any of the above counting techniques. So again, um, if you find counting or even noting the breath helpful, bring it in when you need it. When you don't need it, let go of it. If you don't find it helpful, you can leave it out altogether. But at some point, as we get deeper into the practice, you'll need to let go of that altogether because, of course, it's artificial conceptual activity. But as a beginner, it may be beneficial, it might be helpful. Um, if it is, you can use it. But not everyone finds it helpful. If you don't, you can leave it out altogether. As your mind calms, you may find that your respiration becomes subtler. And this results in fainter sensations of breathing. The further you progress in this practice, the subtler the breath becomes. At times, it may, it may, be, it may become so subtle that you can't detect it at all. This challenges you to enhance the clarity of attention. In other words, you have to pay closer and closer attention to these sensations in order to stay mentally engaged with the breath. So again, you may find, of course, as you get deeper into the practice, the breathing, the mind settles down and then the breathing settles down, which means the sensations here get more and more faint, harder to detect. That challenges you to pay closer and closer attention, therefore it can help to improve clarity. And then he says, there's a kind of biofeedback process at work here. If your mind becomes distracted and you get caught up in involuntary thoughts, your breathing will become coarser, resulting in stronger sensations, which are easier to detect. But as your mind calms down again, the breathing and sensations that go with it become finer, and once again challenges you to heighten the degree of clarity. Mindfulness of breathing has this unique biofeedback advantage. So you may have noticed that already here, is that as your mind calms down, your breathing calms down, sensations get subtler, and that challenge you to pay closer and closer attention helps to improve clarity. But likewise, if the mind starts to get agitated, then the mind, um, then the breathing usually gets much more coarse, much easier to detect the sensations, which means it helps avoid getting distracted. So this uh, mindfulness of breathing has this unique biofeedback advantage, helping us to stay focused. Various sensations may occur in meditation. Sometimes you may feel that your limbs are extremely heavy or thick. Sometimes your body may feel very large. Sometimes, or you may feel like you are floating or levitating. Other sensations such as tingling, vibration, or heat are common. You may experience telescopic vision, viewing your body as if from a distance. Especially when you meditate many hours a day, you may experience within your body prana or vital energies shifting and releasing pockets of tension. When you engage in mindfulness of breathing, these energies begin to balance and flow naturally. This is a process that takes time, and while the energies redistribute themselves, their movement produces various sensations. Don't be worried about them or make a big deal of them. These are natural consequences of the practice. So this is also very important advice. Once we start to get into this practice and go into the, deeper into the practice, as he mentioned, as the body, the mind starts to balance and settle down, the body starts to balance and settle down. And as part of that balancing, the subtle energies in the body start to balance. And that balancing of subtle energies can cause all sorts of sensations in the body. 
as he said, sometimes you may feel like your body's very heavy, very light, very small, very big, uh, floating, uh, tingling, vibration, heat is very common. And these, you'll find, will come up. Some of these um, physical sensations or experiences in the body are very pleasant. Some of them are very un quite unpleasant and maybe even very strange. So the, rec the advice with all of these various bodily experiences is don't make a big deal of them and don't get caught up in them because that's what we tend to do. You know, we may do this meditation and suddenly we have all this uh, sort of blissful flow of sensations in the body and we go, oh, that's so nice, I like that, I want that. And then, of course, we try to hold on to it and then, of course, as soon as we do that, it's gone. And then we try to recreate it. And, of course, when we can't, we get frustrated, frustrated, frustrated. Then our practice has come, we've gone completely astray from our practice and come to a grinding halt. Or if the sensations are, are sort of quite strange or maybe even a bit unpleasant, what we tend to go is, what we tend to do is, oh, what's that? I don't like that. Oh, go away, go away. And then, of course, we develop aversion. Practice comes to a grinding halt. So whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or strange, don't make a big deal out of them. Um, just keep to the practice. They'll come and they'll go, these various experiences. If you're having a certain sensations in the body every single time you meditate, then you may want to have a look at your posture. Maybe you're doing something strange with your posture or you're tensing a lot. Uh, then to check something. But you'll find that these sorts of experiences in the body They'll come and they'll go and not make a big deal out of them. The practice of shamatha results in an anomalous kind of attention. Normally when the mind is relaxed, attention is slack. And when attention is aroused, this brings with a state of tension, a tightening of body and mind. So as I already mentioned, that's normally the habit now. We, when we're relaxed, we tend to be quite dull, when we're alert, we tend to be tensed. But of course, in this practice, we're trying to combine those two. We're trying to be very relaxed and alert at the same time. But in this practice, the more you arouse your attention, the more deeply the mind relaxes. There's a relatively egoless quality to shamatha. While other activities that call for a high level of concentration are effortful and often goal-oriented, Shamatha involves doing almost nothing. You're passively attending to the sensations of the breath without regulating it in any way. Your ego is mostly taken out of commission as you let the body breathe of its own accord, exerting only a subtle degree of effort to balance attention when it falls into laxity or excitation. As you advance in the practice, Increase the, dura the duration of each meditation session and decrease the number of sessions each day. Always go for quality over quantity. So again, keep the sessions short as a beginner. Here, we're doing 20 minutes. For, as a beginner, that's often a good amount of time. Again, some of you may find that a little bit too long. Others may find that you prefer to do a little bit longer. So this is something you can adjust when you go home and you meditate. Uh, pick an amount of time that really works for you. Because if you try to meditate too long, then the latter part of the meditation, you're just going to fall into dullness and distraction. The very things we're trying to overcome. So quality over quantity. If you want to meditate for a longer period in the morning, say, but you can't sustain that. Let's say you want to meditate 30 or 45 minutes, but you can't sustain that. Then break it as you're doing before breakfast, say into two 15 minute sessions with a little two minute break in the middle. So always emphasizing quality over quantity. But as we get deeper into the practice, we will need to extend the amount of time we meditate to go further. How to know when to extend? is when we do this practice, if our normal experience is at the end of the meditation, our normal experience is, oh, it would have been nice to do a little bit longer. If that's our normal experience, that's the time to increase. But only increase like three to five minutes. Don't like go from 20 to 40 minutes. 
small increments, but always emphasising quality over quantity. And we're going to do this a little bit in the coming days. So once we've um, uh, talked about and practised each of the practices, the breath today and then tomorrow the mind and then the next day awareness, then after that we're going to, on the following day, we're going to combine those two practices of the awareness and the mind. And so because they're already familiar, we're going to extend a little bit to 24 minutes. And then on the two meditation days... Um, where we can go deeper into the practice, we, we pick our object, we're going to do some back-to-back -back meditation. So a longer session, but still uh, with a little break in the middle. So then we'll, the total time will extend a little bit. So you'll get be able to go a little bit deeper into the practice. But always emphasising quality over quantity. So that's a little bit more about the practice. So let's go back into this Practice again, observing at the entrance of the nostrils. And again, if you find a lot of tension <coughs> building up in this practice and you can't release it, then go back to the abdomen or full body until you become much more relaxed and then you can go back to the nostrils. So you don't really want to stay at the nostrils, even if it's very clear, if we have a lot of tension in the body and the mind. So again, one 20 minute session. As always, we begin by preparing the body, setting the body into a state of relaxation, stillness and vigilance. And then preparing the mind, setting it into a state of ease and relaxation. 
simply allowing it to come to rest in the present moment. Focusing on the sensations of the breath throughout the body. Now narrow your focus and focus on the sensations of the breath at the entrance of the nostrils and sustain that with mindfulness.